So we've been covering 1 John, but I don't think that's going to quite fit tonight. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bible, if you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Amen. We are not of those who draw back. We're not of those who quit. We're not of those who give up near the finish line. These are the last days, and we all we have to do now is just endure. All we got to do is hang on. Just hang on. Now, that may sound easy, but when the enemy's trying to beat you down, he's trying to pry your fingers off of whatever you're holding on to of God, trying to you know, deceive you into let, making you let go, then you know that he's fighting harder because he knows his time is about done. <laughs> That's like when, you know, like if you watch a movie and the bad guy knows he's about licked and he's about to go down, he's going to play dirty, he's going to do everything he can to make sure the good guy doesn't win. Well, now, one thing, this, this isn't like the movies, this is real life, but I will say, if we've read the Bible, we understand we win. If we endure, if we keep going, if we keep having faith and being moved with God, walking with God, having a relationship with Him, and we don't quit, we don't draw back, we don't let anybody bewitch us, but we press in, we can have the victory. But not only will we have the victory in the end, we can have victory now. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Let's start at verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Now, with that, we know that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church here. He's saying, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. I preach the gospel. There's nothing in me that's worth glory. There's nothing in me. Now, the enemy will tell you that all you serve God. You don't have a life. You don't have this. You don't have that. And the enemy is he's such a liar and such a conniver that he plays on that emotional game with Christians of, oh, you can't have fun, you can't do this, you can't do that, and just makes you believe like there's nothing in life worth living for God anymore. But he's a liar. He's the father of lies. So with this, now we understand Paul's context here, but if, if we kind of see it in that different perspective, that's the way the enemy wants us to believe is there's nothing to glory of with God. Now, Paul is talking about there's nothing in him. He's bragging on God. There's nothing in him to be in pride over. But for necessity is laid up, is laid up on me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He said, I know, I know the benefits of preaching the gospel, but I also know if I don't preach it, the Lord's going to convict me. The Lord's going to rebuke me. So I know I've got to do this. Which, again, kind of goes with the Christian testimony of saying, well... I know, I know that God is real, but I know that the enemy's trying to you know, tell me or I have this thought or I have this kind of mindset that if I, if I just give God up, if I just give up going to church, if I just give up reading the Bible, if I just give up my walk with Him, I'll have all these other things. But we know that Paul here, he's saying, I've, I've been called to preach the gospel, and I know if I don't, the Lord's going to rebuke me. The Lord's going to, He's going to, come after me and kind of get on to me so that kind of mindset of the enemy trying to pull you one way and saying well if you'll give up God you'll have this but on the other hand you also realize well if I do give up God I'll lose this or the Lord will convict me if I don't do that so it's kind of like being pulled in two different directions for if I do this thing willingly I have a reward now here comes a play of the enemy. If I do this willingly, I have a reward. If I do this unto God, God sees it and He honors it and gives us a reward. But if I do this out of, well, I've got to do it, out of a religious tradition or a religiosity, then this, this verse leads, well, let's, let's continue reading. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So in other words, if I do this against my will, then a stewardship of the gospel is entrusted unto me. In other words, if I don't do this, then something's been given to me to do something with and I'm not doing it. 
In other words, we've been, giving, we've been given life, and we're, we were made to worship God. We were made to walk with God. So the enemy tries, he fights tooth and toenail to try to get us not to walk with our God, not to worship Him, and to be focused on ourselves and to be focused on this life. Because so many people are focused on the here and now because it's all they know. That's, you know, I've seen many people, let me rephrase that, I've seen some people never leave their hometown because they've never been anywhere else. They're like, I don't, I don't want to go there. This is what I know. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is the only place I want to go. Now, for some of us, we may say, well, that's silly. We go to Cookville to Walmart, or we go to Cookville to, to bigger stores. We had a Walmart here. We go to this place. We go to that place. And that's kind of silly. There's people that live like that. They said, this is my comfort zone. I don't want to leave it. And so this is what I know, this is, this is all I'm focused on. Well, if you translate that into a life, then they say, well, this is all I know. I don't know about a hereafter. I don't know about that. That's, you know, what if I'm just wasting my time? What if I'm just doing this? What if, I'm do- what if I get to the end of my life and I die and I find out God wasn't real? Now, that's a sad way to think. That's a sad way to live. But what if you get there and what if you didn't prepare to meet your God and all of a sudden you find out, whoops, there he is. I'm not referring to a 90s song either. You, you get to the end of your life and all of a sudden there he is. He's, he's staring at you at the face and you didn't take the time to know him or you quit walking with him. I would rather have the testimony of walking with God, knowing that he was there, get to the end of my life and being proven correct than to give up halfway or to give up three quarters of the way and say, well, maybe he's not real and then find out at the end that I was wrong. That, oh man, man, you know, I, I did believe in him, but I quit. I did walk with him, but I quit. That is not the testimony you want to have for eternity. Not just like, you know, a little while, then all of a sudden you move to a different, you know, different area. No, this is eternity we're talking about. But if we get wrapped up in the here and now, we'll miss that. We'll miss the bigger picture of eternity. Much like when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. He was tempting and he says, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of this. Because the devil was trying to make him focus on the here and now. But Jesus saw the bigger picture. He said, no, 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 no. Mm-mm. No, you don't tempt the Lord your God. You don't tempt God. He began to quote scripture to him. But the enemy also knows scripture. So we've got to know our word. We've got to know, we've got to know the word of God. We've not got to, got to know our God more intimately than he does. Verse 18, for what is my reward then? Verily that I preach, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I, may, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became a Jew, as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Now, I've heard some people pull this out of context and say, well, Paul became all things to all men and he was just like them. People will use this verse to say, oh, well, let's go win the drunks by go drinking with them. Let's go win the adulterers by going committing adultery with them. No, no, no. That's not what Paul is talking about. Paul, for, for a lack of a better example, Paul is saying, when, if I know that I'm around mechanics, I'm going to speak to them about the gospel in a way that a mechanic would understand. I'm going to relate it to how you would work on a car, how a car works. Or if I'm going to minister to carpenters, I'm going to tell them about woodworking. But it's all about the gospel. I'm describing it in a way I'm trying to help them understand it in terms that they know. Not that he compromised himself, but he's relating it in terms that they know. You know, that's like for, you know, when I speak in military terms or if I, you know, do a, do a story from my military time, some people that's been in the military, they can relate to that story. They say, oh, yeah, I remember those days. I remember, that. you know, if I say, you know, certain acronyms, then they will get that. They will get there because they've been there. But for other people, they're like, I don't know what that means. So I have to stop and explain that. But if I'm speaking to a group of people, and especially when I was in the military and I would either give a devotional or, or teach for a moment or have a Bible study, I could speak in those terms and they all understood exactly what I was talking about. 
So this is, this is truly what Paul is talking about here, that he became all things to all men. He, became, he talked like the Jews to the Jews. He understood that. So verse 21, to them that are without the law, as without the law, being not, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So he's saying, I'm trying to learn all of these ways of speaking the gospel to all these people that I might win somebody. Now, you got to know that that took work. That took work for him to understand the ins and outs of the way that they're thinking, the way that they're processing things, the way that they see things. That took work for Paul, not only to maybe study it, to understand it, to talk to somebody, to gather their ideas, but also to rely on the Holy Spirit to allow him to speak the Word of God and how God wanted him to speak to those people. So he couldn't you know, get in the middle of speaking and all of a sudden just give up. Well, this is just too hard. He had to rely on God, but he also had to do his work to put in the, to try to understand the knowledge and the what their their viewpoint was. So verse 23, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Now with this example, you know, we, we understand that runners, when they're running, they're running a race, they just can't quit and expect a prize. Well, I just I got three quarters of the way. Let's just I'm done. All done. I just give up. Don't feel like running anymore. But it's the ones, you know, of course, this is a race, so one person wins the prize, but in the race for life and the race of your faith, when you cross the finish line and you make it into heaven. You've received your prize, but we can't quit. You know, Jesus said, you know, in, in the Gospels, he said, Though you must endure. The, the one that endures to the end will be saved. We must endure. We must push through. You know, many times in the military when I, we were running or doing things, I would just think, you know, I knew how, I usually knew roughly how far we were going to run. So how far we went out, uh, that, was, that was the unknown, but as soon as we got there and they started turning us around, in my mind, I started calculating. I, I know exactly where we're going back to. I know exactly how far it is to the finish line. So that, in my mind, you could either take it two way, one of two ways. All right, that's a long way. I just give up. I quit. That wasn't an option. Because if you quit, everybody around you is going to say, no, 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 you can't quit. we got to keep running in circles until you gather up and muster enough strength to run with us. All right, so that's not a good option. Or I can, in my mind, say, I know how far it is. I've already been to the halfway point. Now we're working our way back. Now, if I can just focus my mind, once I get there, I know I'll be getting closer. I know I'll be getting closer. I know I'll be getting closer. And I can see where we're going, and I can start rejoicing in my heart. There it is. There it is. There's the end line. I can quit running. I can quit running. And I can rejoice that all of the hard work is behind me. Well, for these last days, we don't know when the day that the Lord's coming back. No man knows the hour of the day. But we know that the days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. We're getting close to the last day because we're in the last days, but we're getting close to Jesus coming back, so we can't quit now. We've got to see that. We may not know the day or the time, but we can say, all right, Lord, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. I'm going to continue running. I'm going to endure to the end, so I'm saved. And we use the term, are you saved? Are you born again? We use that term loosely, but to truly be saved doesn't mean that, you're, that you went to an altar you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ, and now you're saved forever, and there's nothing else you got to do. We're technically not saved until we reach heaven. Now, we use that term, we understand that, being born again, because you're technically not born again of the flesh, but you're born again of the Spirit. But we say saved, that's another vernacular way to put it. It all means the same thing, but it means that you've been saved from your sin, you've been saved from hell, but it's still our duty to endure until the end to see it through. 
Just because you become a runner doesn't mean that you'll finish your race. Just because you do something doesn't mean that you'll finish out to be that. There's many people that start college and never finish. Well, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be a doctor. And then they never finish it. Even though they started, even though they got through some med classes, even though they you know, made a good trek down that journey, they never fully made it. So just because you start something doesn't mean that you'll finish it. But we've got to be that determined people to say, no, I've started my walk with God. I'm going to see it through. I'm going to finish. Because with men, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So He can give me strength. He can give me everything I have need of because He's God. And when I put my faith and trust in Him, I know that He's there. I know that He'll see me through. Amen. Verse 24 again. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Run your race that you may obtain. Because God has something for every one of us if we don't quit and we cross our finish line. The only way that we'll cross the finish line together is if we're all raptured out of here, which I wouldn't put it past the Lord that we would all be raptured out of here soon. But we also got to be in the mindset of I'm not giving up. Even if he doesn't come back for another hundred years, I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm finishing. I'm crossing my finish line. Praise God. And every man that striveth or competes for the prize, for the mastery, is temperate or has self-control in all things. What? Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He has self-control. Yes, because one, you got to control your mind. Because if you don't control your mind, the enemy will get in your mind and make you go squirrely. Oh, this is not worth it. This is not worth it anymore. At one time, being a Christian was fun. Now it's not fun anymore. There's nobody else that wants to serve me. There's nobody my age. There's nobody this. There's nobody that. I feel all alone. That's the way Elijah felt. The prophet Elijah. It's exactly the way he felt. But he wasn't alone. It was the enemy lying to him. It was his own mind deceiving him and believing this lie of, oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Nobody else serves God but me. That's a lie. Now, you also got to remember, that came after his biggest victory that he would ever have. After having a showdown with the prophets of Baal, that was his biggest victory and that's exactly when the enemy tried to play mind games with him. So if you're, if you're doing things for God and you're on fire for him, so to speak, or even if you've done something great for him, you got to know the enemy's going to try to use some kind of thing to put you out. He's going to try to use whatever fire extinguisher he's got. He's going to try to do whatever to put your fire out for God so that he can play games with your mind and have you. That's like, that's like committing adultery or fornication. Unless you're a complete floozy, it doesn't happen o- overnight. It takes a little bit at a time. A little flirt here, a little flirt there, a little batting of the eyes, a little touch here, a little touch there. That's the way it happens. That's the way the enemy works. The enemy says, a little doubt here. Let's throw this over there. Well, you're the only one your age. Or a little over here. I, you know, It'll take years before God comes back. Little seed of doubt over here. And if you don't catch those seeds, if you don't say, no, 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 enemy, I'm not falling for that. That's not growing in my garden. You get that junk out of here. You, you get that junk out of here. I'm not allowing that to grow in my mind. I'm not allowing that to grow in my heart. I serve the true and living God. I'm not quitting on him. He hasn't quit me, so I'm not quitting him. You get your seeds and you get out of here because you ain't planting that here. But you've got to be able to call those things out to get those seeds out and to throw them out where they belong. They belong in the dump. Amen. (laughs) For every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible. (laughs) He says those racers, the ones that are actually running a race, a physical race, they do it for something that will perish. They do it for something that won't last very long. But what we do when we run our race for God, it's an incorruptible crown. It's something that will never die. It's something that will never pass away. 
Because we're going to a kingdom where God is making for us. God is making for us to go to worship Him. God is making for us to join Him where He will sit high and lifted up on His throne that we can be with Him forever. That's the crown. That we can take all those crowns that we earn here and we can lay them at His feet. Now that's something to think about. We earn crowns and things here that we can lay it at God's feet. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I want to have something to lay down at his feet. And I really, if you truly love God, it's not going to be one of those things where I, I got this little measly crown right here. Well, there you go, God. When we, if we have a true love for God, we want to gather up as much as we can to lay it down at his feet. That's like, you know, I know this is a poor example, but any birthday, any holiday or things that come up where we give gifts, I always feel like I don't get my wife enough. Why? Because I love her that much. I don't, I don't mind spending money, but I try to be a good financial steward as well, sometimes. So, <laughs> that was a joke. It's okay. But I try, to, I try to show my wife that I love her by buying her things, nice things, that I want to express that love in that manner. Not just with saying I love you, but showing that I, want to, I don't mind spending money on her because I love her. Well, if you really love somebody, you don't mind you know, spending money, you don't mind gathering things to give unto them. So if we truly love God, why wouldn't we want to continue pressing in? Yes, yes, that getting up on this day or staying up late on that day. Yes, gathering up all of these crowns, gathering up all these jewels, but I get to lay them at the feet of Jesus. But it also requires us not to seek recognition here. Because the more that we seek recognition here, the less we'll have to lay at Jesus' feet because that steals the rewards that we offer unto God because we brag about it before men or we allow other men to just see it and we exploit it. Verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Saying, so I run... Not with uncertainty, because I know where I'm headed. I know what I'm to do. But he says, I also fight, not as one that beats the air. You can also think of like Rocky or some of those other boxing movies where they're just, they're practicing, they're just beating in the air. What's that do? All it is is training. They're not really fighting anybody. They're not really doing anything but training their mind or, or, or moving with their body. Verse 27, but I keep, my, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So we keep our body under subjection. Part of your body is your mind. That we must keep it under subjection. We keep our body under subjection. We say, your body says, no, 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 I want, I want to rest today. I want to be lazy. I want to be lazy. No, we don't have time to be lazy. No, we got to get up. We got to go. You tell your, tell your mind, no, we're getting up. We're going. Now, we've all experienced this. We've all had a moment of just where we didn't want to move. We didn't want to do anything. We'd just rather go back to sleep. But that's when we got to tell ourselves, no, no, no. No, no, no. We're doing this for God. We're living for God. We're going to worship Him. We're going to honor Him. So we're going to get to moving and we're going to enjoy it. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Not the joy of, of how I feel at the moment. Because if you went by that, you'd never have joy. It's the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we do everything that we do for Him. You notice the Word tells us that we do all things as unto Christ. That means that everything we do should be glorifying Him. Well, what if I'm just scrubbing the toilet? We'll do it as unto Christ. What if I'm just sweeping the floor? We'll do it unto Christ. What if I'm making a widget? We'll do it unto Christ. Whatever we do, we do it to glorify God. But the enemy will use that. Well, nobody ever sees you do this. Nobody ever sees you do that. I don't want nobody to see me. Enemy, shut your mouth. I want my God to see me. Because I don't want my reward stolen here. I want to give it to God. So shut your mouth. What I'm doing is not for nothing. What I'm doing is for God. So shut your mouth, you liar. Go back to hell where you belong. Leave me alone. I'm submitting myself unto God. I'm resisting you. And you got to flee. So take your lies with you. Take your seeds of doubt with you. Leave me alone. <laughs> but here's what's going to happen, though. 
He'll, he'll walk off for a little while, but you better believe a little time will pass and he'll try to come back. That's when you got to do it again. Repeat the process. It's like lather, you know, rinse, repeat. You just got to keep doing it. Keep doing it. Because the one time that you stop, that's when he's got you. That's when he starts putting those seeds and then those seeds begin to grow. But we can't do that. We cannot do that. Amen. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. That means there's a burden to be born, to carry. We all have our own weight we got to carry. I'm not just talking about your physical weight. I'm talking about the whatever burden, whatever thing that you're carrying, whatever thing that you have, it's there. But notice even Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that means we don't get out of just not doing anything. No matter what TBN tries to tell you, no matter what prosperity thing they try to gimmick you into, we know that the kingdom of God is W-O-R-K. It's work. And we can't quit. We can't give up. For every man shall bear his own burden. That means we're all pulling together. You know, that's like you see the, you know, whether it's a movie or a show or whatever, and you think about the old times when they had these big, massive ships and they had all these people underneath where they were rowing. Now, you get, you get one man, he gets out of sync, guess what's going to happen? It's going to cause some issues for whoever's sitting next to him, whoever, sitting, whoever is sitting next to him. It's going to cause some issues, but if you keep doing that, the weight and that burden is easier because we're all working together. All working together. Now, does everybody have his own weight? Absolutely. Everybody's got to do their job. Everybody's got to pull up, push down. Pull up, push down. Everybody's got to do that. But when you get everybody together, much like a church family, when you can come together, those burdens feel lighter because you're working together. You're praying for one another. You get to rejoice with one another. You cry with one another when the appropriate time is. But even with that kind of burden, it doesn't feel so heavy because you've got others that are, that are sharing that burden with you. But still, when it all boils down to it, we all have our own burden to carry. We've all got it. So that means that the enemy, that when the enemy tries to tell you to quit, it'll be easier. Just give this up. Just give that up. There's going to be a burden. So Jesus said his yoke is easy, his burden is light. So I'd rather take the lighter burden with Jesus Christ than to take the burden of sin, shame, guilt, condemnation, everything the enemy's going to try to give you, I'd rather have Jesus' burden knowing that he's helping me carry it, knowing that I've got brothers and sisters in Christ that are praying for me and I can pray with them, pray for them, knowing the burden is lighter than to give in to any lie of the enemy knowing that this is going to be much more worse. Amen. So verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teach us in all good things. But be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So when you sow something, if you sow good things unto God and unto his kingdom, you're going to reap that. But if you listen to a lie of the enemy and you start sowing bad seed, you're going to have to reap that as well. Because God's not mocked. Now, that means if you, in this context of kind of what we're saying tonight, is if you have been serving God, and then all of a sudden you say, well, you know what? I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't know if I just want to serve this anymore. I don't want to serve God anymore. And you start sowing those seeds of quit, of doubt, of things of that nature. God's not going to be mocked. He's going to let you have what you want. God's going to say, if that's what you want, then you can have it. I don't, want to, I don't want to watch you walk away. I don't want to see you go down this road. But if that's what you want, that's what you'll get. Because not, God's not going to be mocked. So 
With that kind of attitude, with that kind of testimony, what God will do, as we've talked about before, God will go from a hand of blessing because you serve Him to a hand of resistance. Because He's not going to let you keep sowing seeds of doubt, fear, sin, things of that nature. He's not going to keep doing that and keep blessing you. A moment of ignorance, a moment of stupidity, God may say, all right, you need to correct that, you need to fix that. But you keep sowing that, you keep sowing that, you keep sowing that, He's eventually going to say, I can't help you. You're sowing that, you've got to reap that. But it's in those moments that we need to cry out to God and say, God, help me, forgive me, cleanse me. So don't be deceived just because you say, well, I sinned that one time and got away with it. I sowed that seed over there, but I got away with it. Don't think that God's going to continue to be mocked because he won't. That's when we got to say, you know what? I did do that. Because the enemy's going to try to use that. Well, it happened once and nothing happened. It'll be okay if you do it again. No, 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 no. God won't be mocked. God will see that and God will say, no, you need to correct that. Fix that. So God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. For if he soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. So if you keep sowing to the flesh, the things that are now, the things that are here, the things that you can see, that's what you're going to reap. You keep doing things just because maybe you, you, you had that attitude of quit, so your heart's given up a long time ago, but your flesh hasn't caught up with the quit yet. You're going to reap that as well. So you've got to engage your heart to say, no, no, no. What I'm doing, I'm doing for God, and I believe in it. I'm sowing to the Spirit. I'm not sowing to the flesh. I'm sowing to the Spirit. Because I walk with my God. I'm sowing into my relationship with Him. That's how you reap everlasting life, is you sow into your relationship with God. You sow into the things of the Spirit. But verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, period. Nope. If, there's that big two-letter word, we faint not. If we do not lose heart. So even Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, and he's telling him, don't be weary in well-doing. That means you've been doing so good. You're doing the right thing. Don't quit now. That's like, that's like when I was at towards the end of my, my second master's, and I know that may sound like, oh, man, he had... By the time I got to the end of my second master's, I was just like, I'm done. I quit. I don't care if I ever go back to school. I don't want to do this no more. I'm so sick and tired of school. But I got down to my last three classes, and my attitude was poor. My attitude was, I've done so much school. I don't care if I, I, don't care if I graduate or not. I'm just done. I'm tired of writing papers, tired of researching stuff, tired of barely getting sleep. I'm just done. With three classes left. So I think all of that time was doing good, doing good, doing good, but little seeds here and there. Oh, this is getting old. Oh, all right, all right here we go. Oh, I've got so many more classes left. Oh, all right, here we go. Those little seeds, by the time I got to three classes left, was just like, I just quit. Lord, just, if you love me, just kill me. I don't know. Just, just let me not. Help me just to be rid of this school stuff. But I realized I've come this far. And honestly, honestly, Miss Tiffany was like, honey, you're almost done. You're almost done. You only got three classes left. You only got two classes left. You're almost done. And I was like, praise God for a good help me. Because I'd have quit a long time ago. But I didn't. And I pressed in. Got my master's. Praise God. It looks nice hanging on my wall. Other than that, it's like, meh, I don't know. It's nice for a wall decoration. I will say, I was, it has helped me a lot with, with different books and classes and things I've come across that, is, that has helped me, so I won't say that it's just a wall decoration. I guess that's a little bit of my bitterness. I guess I'm just going to tell off on myself. But with that, I could have given up and not received that. So yes, that may be a silly example of you know, college or school, but how come we do the God the same way? We get tired of doing something He's asked us to do, 
and then we're ready for something else. We're ready to move on. We're ready to, to pick something else up just because we're tired of the old. People do this with marriage. People do this with friendships. People do this with jobs. People do this with churches. People do it with all kinds of things. But God's not called us to quit. God has called us to endure. God has called us to not grow weary in well-doing. Because notice, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season, at the appropriate time, it's not appropriate time for us to quit yet, due season, we shall reap if we faint not. So that means there's a harvest there, but you've got to wait till harvest season. To quit God now is not the proper season. To quit God ever is not the proper season. But we push through until we reap the benefits when we get to walk into the kingdom of God and lay our crowns and everything that we've earned, we lay them down at His feet. That's when we can finally say, oh, I've kept the faith. I've run my race. I've done everything that God asked me to. Not perfectly, but I endured. I tried to be a good and faithful steward, steward, of, a steward of everything He's given me. Now I get to enter into the joy of my Lord. Praise God. But it's all if we don't quit, if we don't fall for the, en- the enemy's lies. Amen. So verse 10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. So let us do good to all men. That means <laughs> that means you can't just do good in front of the ones that you go to church with. You can't just do good at the ones that you know that you'll see again and treat everybody else bad. That's what's given the church a black eye. That's what's given Christians a black eye is because many people say, well, I'll never see that person again. So they become a Karen. They become a whatever male equivalent to a Karen is. And they treat people horribly but it will always come back to you. There was, there was a person I met a few years ago. I was actually doing my job. Got to meet somebody, younger person. I was introduced to him briefly. And I said, hi, how you doing? And this lady said, you know, I'm doing good, how are you? I said, I'm doing good. That's it. I thought, that's it. That's the only time I'll ever see that person. Not knowing they would eventually make their way to Engrafted Word Church. Not knowing they would eventually make their way to very close to us. Not knowing that they would be here tonight. That's how close that person is. That a few years ago, if I'd have treated like trash and been some religious Christian and could have been, you know, had a sour attitude or whatever, could have burned a bridge before God even got to build one. Now, I say that to say, if we have that kind of attitude, but we can't, that shows that we're ready to quit, that we're only putting on a facade because we know others are around that we've got to be proper and religious in front of. But if quit's not in us, we'll treat everybody with the love of God. We'll treat everybody the way that we should, the way Jesus taught us to, because he said we're supposed to love God and love our neighbor, and all the rest of the commandments are hinged upon those two. So if we love our God, we will love our neighbor. If we love our neighbor, neighbor then everything else will fall into place as well. But we can have that quit in us. Quit shows you have no love for God. Quit shows you have no love for your fellow man. Quit shows all you care about yourself. That's what quit means. You quit a job, I quit. Especially nowadays, they, put, they don't put in two-week notices. I quit, I'm done. Because it's all about them. It's not being respectful. It's not about proper protocol it's not about doing what's right it's all about being selfish so if you sow that seed of quit especially with God you'll reap that because when it comes to the end of it it comes the end of your life if you've sown that into God and you've quit him and when it comes time for eternity you'll reap that God will say "I, I don't know you I may have known you one time, but I don't know you now because you turned your back on me. You left me. You left me high and dry because you loved yourself more than you loved me. May that not be any of us. 
May we, ha- may we muster up some kind of drive and, and motivation in us to say, Lord, help me to find my first love. Help me to go back to my first love. Because remember, in the book of Revelation, that was one of the things that Jesus called out with the churches for. You've left your first love, which was who? Him. Because they love themselves more. So we can't quit on God. We can't fall out of love with Him or the Holy Spirit or the Word of God or Jesus Christ. We must stir ourselves up. We must build ourselves up in our most holy faith. Whether that's listening to praise and worship and stirring up that worship in us. Whether it's reading the Word of God and stirring that love and that desire and that that relationship back up. Whether it's praying and, and crying out to God on a regular basis and stirring that up and within us. I mean, honestly... If you really love God, you'll do all three of these. And you'll be in the house of God because you love God. And if you do those, and you're you're checking your attitude to make sure you're not doing it just to look good in front of others, but you're doing it because you have a love for God, then all you're going to do is build that fire. Build that fire. Build that fire within you. Build that fire, that zeal of God to say, you know what? I love my God. I love my God. Because the more that you walk with him, the more he's going to prove himself faithful, and the more that will build your fire. Mr. Morris and I have had a lot of conversations about this. You read the word of God, God will speak to you. He is faithful in doing so. Because he wants us in this word so he can either open the word of God unto us to give us revelation, or he can speak to us and show us things from the word of God. Either way, you're going to benefit from it. But it requires that sometimes that self-motivation to say, I don't feel like reading today. I don't feel like reading today. And then you got to realize, wait a minute. Something smells. Oh, it's my attitude. Maybe I should change it. Maybe I should wash it with the water of the word. Maybe I should read anyway, even though I don't feel like it. Maybe I should pray today because I don't feel like it. Maybe I should worship God because I don't feel like it. Maybe I should go to church because I don't feel like it. Because if you have that self-control, that temperance, as we talked about a moment ago from 1 Corinthians, if you have that temperance, that self-control, you will align things in your life because you have control over yourself. To say, no attitude, we're not doing that today. No mind, we're not thinking that way. No, we're not having that sour attitude. We're lining things up with the Word of God, and that's what we're doing. Amen. So may we not quit. May we not give up. One one more verse. Let's let's end on on a good note. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. One verse. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. But notice, there's a key word. For with. With God. It's not separate from God. It's not you doing your own thing. It's with God. Nothing shall be impossible. Well, I've sinned. I've went too far out. No, no, no. With God, nothing shall be impossible. So with God, 1 John, as we learned a couple weeks ago, he, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins, of all unrighteousness. So that means that that lie of the enemy that you're too far gone, that's a lie. Because with God, it's possible for Him to wash you, to cleanse you. Well, I don't know if I'll ever get my love for God back. With God, nothing is impossible. So with God, He can show you how to rekindle that fire, how to stir yourself back up. Well, I don't know if I'll ever do this again, or I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that again. With God... Nothing shall be impossible. So seek Him. Seek His wisdom. Seek His Word. Cry out to Him. 
Get praise and worship. Knock that doubt off of you. Knock that fear off of you. Knock that whatever that junk of the enemy is trying to lay on you. Knock it off. Knock it off. <laughs> Put on the whole armor of God. Worship God in spirit and in truth. It'll put a little fight in you. Tell you what, you feel like quitting, I'm going to prescribe you something. I want you to write down everything that God's given you. Everything he's done for you. And after you've read that ten times, see if you still want to quit. Now, I'm not saying like, well, he, he gave me this and he gave me that. And that's it. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm being very serious. You write down every little thing that God has ever given you in your life. Because when you look back and you see how much God has moved and done for you, you'll begin to realize all the times that He was there, that He never left you nor forsook you, that He was there with you and helped you. And you'll, that'll build, and that'll start building your faith and building your love back for God to where you say, no, nah, God's done too much for me. I can't quit now. Amen. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. So walk with God. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Nobody likes a quitter. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> This is the army of God. And for everybody that tried to quit in the military when I was in basic training, they didn't just say, oh, I'm done, and then they just shipped them home. No, 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 no. They got to circle that mountain until the military got their $40,000 worth of those people. Because that's how much it costs for one recruit to go through basic training. So they made sure they were going to get their money's worth. So in other words, they got to repeat all kinds of different things, all kinds of tasks, got assigned new things because they had quit in them. They couldn't just quit and go home. I say that to say this. This is the army of God. And you will keep circling a mountain until you either completely deny God and say, I'm done, I don't want you anymore, and you can go do your own thing, which will not go well for you. Because that's like choosing death, because the wages of sin is death. Or, you'll keep circling the mountain because you're barely hanging on to God. You'll keep circling the mountain, circling the mountain, circling the mountain, until you finally say, you know what, Lord, I'm tired of circling this mountain. Help me to conquer this thing. Help me to get away from this thing. And you know what? God will say, I've been waiting for you to ask. I've been waiting for you to come to me, because I've got the answer. I've got the map. It's called the Word of God. I've got the light. It's called the Word of God. I've got everything you have need of. It's right here, and it's called the Holy Spirit as well. So, he said, I've got all, everything you need to quit circling this mountain, to quit being lost. All I've been doing is waiting for you to ask. Because the Word says, ask and you shall receive. Not mope around, circle the mountain, and hope that you receive it. Ask and you shall receive. Amen. So don't quit. Talk to God. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what he wants. Don't quit. Keep pressing in. Keep seeking God. Amen.